Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar. Nor I, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, before we webinar, I have a few of uh, technical problems taken care of and um, information background for you. If you Welcome to today's webinar. My name is John Norai. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, our top, well, that's my data. Now, practical tool to pl to plan using differentiated instruction. If you are experiencing difficulties during the webinar today, you can call the toll-free number that's on your screen now, 855-9002, and the ID number at the bottom of the screen in red if you call into that number. So please be sure you have 110-287-019 recorded. We'd like to extend the asking you to um, tweet as we as we um, have our discussion and our Twitter at NASSP and hashtag NASSP webinar is what we'd like you to use. Of course we're also on Facebook and uh, you see our webinar on the screen. If you're looking for a certificate of attendance, that's at the bottom of the screen. I'll give you a moment to jot that information down so that you can uh, pursue that if that's something you choose to do. We're pleased that the uh, Wallace Foundation has funded these webinars and we that we interact, interact with them as we um, work through um, this uh, research that's being done around the country. On the screen you see the names of uh, people participating today, or some of the names of people participating today, and I'm going to turn the mic over in just a minute to Jana Freeler, but before I do, let me introduce Jana and the other uh, principals that we have on online today. Jana is the owner of JLF Consulting. She's a retired high school administrator and has previously been president of NASSP. She now works as a professional development faculty member for NASSP. Tisha Green is in her ninth year as an elementary principal. She's currently the principal of Oakhurst STEAM Academy, uh, a K-5 elementary school in Charlotte Mecklenburg School District, where she has served since it reopened in the 2015-16 school year. Dr. Green began her educational career as a high school English teacher before working in the central office as a secondary resource teacher and executive coordinator for assistant superintendent and chief academic officer. Dr. Green is a national board certified and holds a BA in English and MA in English education from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. A principal certification from Western Carolina University and an EDD from Wingate University. Danielle Moore was appointed as principal to Gwynn Park Middle School in June of 2010. Mrs. Moore implemented her vision of academic excellence through creating a safe and orderly environment for students to learn and teachers to grow professionally. In seven years, Mrs. Moore has worked to build a culture of collaboration by providing teachers with the time, resources, and professional development needed to successfully plan and implement lessons for all students. Eddie Maresh is the principal of Creekland Middle School in Gwinnett County, Georgia. It's a very diverse school with over 2,000 students. He has worked in education for 23 years. He received his doctorate from the University of Georgia in educational leadership, and he lives in Lawrenceville, Georgia. He's married and has two sons. And I'd like to, at this point, go back to Jana Freeler, who is with us today. And Jana will be talking a little bit about the background of this project. Jana? OK, thank you, John. Um, the slide that you have in front of you right now is the method that we used in order to bring our principles together and really focus on developing tools that would create sustainable change within their schools but also to have an impact with principals across the country. So um, we use design thinking methodology. And in design thinking methodology, you can see that there are five distinct steps to this process, but also that it is an iterative process and it is cyclical. So um, once you begin a step, it doesn't mean you can't go back to a step. But we use this very 
strategically because we found that when we work with people across the country, design thinking methodology really helps to um, open that collaboration and best practices discussion and allows principals to work on developing tools that will really impact the profession. John, next slide, please. There we go. So, so John did mention that um, we are fortunate to be supported by the Wallace Foundation and um, obviously worked with NASSP and the Wallace Foundation. And um, specifically, we used the Wallace Five Key Leadership Practices when we focused our work. And today's webinar is going to focus on the fifth practice, which is managing people, data, and processes to foster school improvement. Next slide. So I'm going to turn this over to Eddie, and he's going to talk about the design challenge and about his school. Sure. Thank you. Um, and so as uh, was just discussed, uh, we had the opportunity as principals to uh, really uh, focus on the pivotal practices. And those five pivotal practices, as you can see, are very comprehensive and, and really cover all the different things that uh, principals are, are asked to do. And they're all, you know, important in and of themselves. But uh, the one that we focused on, number five, uh, has to do with obviously a big part of our job is managing people, data, and processes to foster school improvement. Uh, and when you look at that, that, that covers a whole range of things. If you think about the processes that we're, that principals are responsible for, all the data that we uh, deal with, and, and the even the HR managing people side of things, uh, there's a lot to it. And so we really, uh, look, when we looked at it, we, we tried to figure out how to narrow it down and we went through an iterative process to, to figure out what uh, piece of that or component of that pivotal practice we would want to focus on uh, and, and really where maybe the most impact is. And, and so as, as um, instructional leaders, uh, we kind of narrowed it down. So you can see on the slide, um, and really it comes down to to what is highlighted in red, but I want to go ahead and show the whole part of it for you. Uh, how might we use student work as a data source to plan instruction? As a part of this design challenge, we've worked to design tools to make efficient and effective analytical use of student work as a mechanism to drive instructional decisions. And so then that red piece is, uh, is critical. This tool focuses on the planning of instruction after the analysis of student work rather than the analysis itself. And so as a part of the Wallace uh, PLC group of principals, uh, we really dove deeply into this. We consulted with national experts. We uh, really looked at all the, you know, all the elements that go into doing this well. And, and what we found was that there's, you know, there's a lot of data out there. We all have a lot of data, and we all typically have a process of looking at the data. But really, kind of where the roadblocks and the challenges has occurred is once you've analyzed the data, then then the now what or so what happens next uh, was the critical piece. And so that's what we chose to focus on and, and really looking at a tool that will help uh, move that work forward uh, after you've analyzed it. So that, that was our design challenge and process. So next slide, John. All right, so this time I'll turn over to uh, uh, Tisha Green. So Oak Brook Steam Academy um, is uh, my school, and it's a, a kindergarten through fifth grade elementary school. It's in the Charlotte Mecklenburg School District, which is a, a very large urban school district in North Carolina. We have a, about 650 students, and we're a partial steam magnet that opened in um, the 2015-16 school year. And part of our challenge was as a school that was reopening and pulling students from several different schools across the county, um, we had to really look at the data and try to figure out where were our students and how could we really leverage um, work samples and data to move our students, specifically because we had um, a large population of English language learners we were a Title I school, but we also knew that we wanted to stay true to our magnet theme um, and integrate project-based learning with our students. And next slide. 
and then I'll turn it over to Danielle Moore. Hello, um, I'm the principal at Gwen Park Middle School, which is um, a considered a small middle school in a large urban district of Prince George's County in Maryland. Um, we have about 640 students here in our building uh, in grades six through eight. Um, one of the focus areas for our particular school this year is trying to move our data. Um, our school uh, does not have a lot of turnover, so our, our teachers um, have been here for a while, but I've noticed that our data has become very stagnant, meaning that we have not had a jolt or move in our data in quite some time. And so we are utilizing this particular tool to really dig deep into our teacher practices as well as what we're doing in the classroom to move that pendulum with regards to our data. Um, so once again, we're a small middle school, 640 students, normally it's about 1,000 students in middle school, so we're considered a pretty small school. Um, our teachers are very comfortable um, in the building and comfortable with instruction. However, I've noticed that they're still doing things the same way, and so we're getting the same results, and so it's now time to shake things up, and so this tool helped us do that. Next slide. All right, and again, this is Eddie Moresh, and I uh, am the principal of Creekland Middle School. Uh, Creekland Middle School is located in Gwinnett County in Georgia. It's Lawrenceville, kind of a suburb of Atlanta. Uh, it, it's on the larger side, uh, as uh, was stated earlier. We have about 2,100 students, um, and actually when it opened in 1996, it was uh, the largest middle school in, in the universe, pretty much. It had uh, over 3,000 students uh, at its highest. Um, but fortunately, we, you know, we've had some relief, and so now we're down to about 2,000, a little over 2,000. And so uh, when we look at the data challenge for, for my school or Crickland Middle School, it really it, it kind of reflects what, what we see even across the country is this, uh, the changes in demographics. Um, when the school opened, it was, it was, it was very homogenous, um, very low, free and reduced percentage. Um, and, and we've seen the demographics really change, where it's become much more diverse. If you see the pie chart there, uh, it, it's almost like a third, third, third um, as far as African American, Hispanic, and white. And, and uh, but we've seen those numbers even change uh, since that slide is uh, was created. Um, and so, with the changes uh, comes the challenge of making sure that we're still meeting the needs of all of our students, because uh, our free and reduced population has gone up. Um, and so the challenge is making sure that we're still having high expectations of our students. You know, there was a time when we were pretty homogenous where we could kind of teach to the middle and get pretty good results and, and, and everybody felt good about things. Uh, but we're really at a place now where if we're not strategic about making sure that we, we're differentiating and really digging into the data to make sure that all of our students uh, are, are getting the supports they need, then, then we're not going to be successful as a school. And, and so that, that obviously is, is the key component. So uh, when I think of Creekland Middle School and, and all, the, all the students that are reflected in it, um, and that's, that's the challenge of just making sure that we're, we're meeting all their needs. Uh, and so that's where this tool and this process has been valuable uh, as we've looked at how we can do that successfully. Okay? And so that's the context of uh, Creekland Middle School. But really on the next slide, uh, if you'll switch to the next slide, what we want our participants, uh, the folks out there that are listening, to really think about is, so what is the challenge at your school? We all, we all have tons of data, uh, and, and sometimes you can get that paralysis from analysis, and, and you're just inundated with it, but the real challenge is making it meaningful for us as leaders, for our teachers, uh, so that it, it translates into uh, meaningful actions uh, that impact our students uh, in the right way. So uh, really what we want you to do um, so that's kind of interactive is to really think about what are your data challenges, and I don't, I don't know if logistically if people can even type in uh, maybe what what challenges you're facing at your school, but um, but what we found out through this process that was uh, encouraging and, and uh, a good thing is that that all of us have you know different unique challenges on one hand, but also there are a lot of similarities in that we're all kind of facing. You know, how do, how do we meet the needs of all our students? How do we ensure that our teachers are differentiating uh, and, and doing those kind of things? So uh, that, that really is the context that we want you to look through this is how can this help you and benefit you at the school that you're at um, and whatever your needs may, may be, you know, whether you're a large school, small school, really diverse, affluent, 
um, you know, a Title I school, whatever your context is, um, we all have this similar sort of challenge of making sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our students. Eddie, in response to your invitation to write uh, challenges down, uh, several have come in. One is um, uh, repeat discipline referrals, another is low reading levels. And folks, if you're typing in um, those kinds of things, please do those and as well as questions in the question box. Okay, great. Well, that's great to hear. Certainly, uh, the discipline data and, and obviously how well we're meeting the needs of all our kids and differentiating that has an impact on, on how our students behave, if they feel engaged or connected to the, the work, uh, if they're finding success, uh, that obviously can have an impact. Uh, reading, you know, literacy and those areas are focuses, you know, an area of focus for, for our whole cluster here uh, where I'm at because we've seen the challenges uh, that, that can come when our students aren't uh, successful as readers um, and that kind of thing. So thank you for sharing uh, some of your contacts out, that are out there. So on the on the next slide, you know, we always talk about wanting, to, you know, starting with the why, and I think we kind of have hit on it in, in multiple ways. But on this slide, you can see pictures from from all of our schools, all the three schools represented. Um, you know, you can see the students coming from various backgrounds, uh, different places, and that kind of thing. And, and really, it's about um, making sure that none of them fall through the cracks. That each and every one of them is getting what they need, and that that is the hard work of, of being a a leader, but also the hard work that our teachers face, um, where, where that's what we're asking them to do is really drill down to every single child, um, and that is, is an easy. And so that's, um, but that is the why, because you know, as, as a leader, as a principal, there are a lot of things that can keep you up at night um, with data and processes and managing people. But really, there's no more compelling, I think, question or um, item than you know, are we truly helping every one of our students be successful and meeting them where they are. And so that's why this work has been so valuable and, and I think so critical and important. Here's another uh, comment that just came in. Just beginning data collection now, how do I start? Okay. Well, this tool uh, hopefully will, will be one way that you can look at it and start, um, you know, depending upon your system, uh, your, your school, and what resources you have. Uh, we're fortunate that, that with technology and those kind of things, a lot of the data is available to you if you're doing, you know, certain common assessments or those kind of things where, or district assessments where that data is provided. But um, even if not, I think the tool that we're going to show you can be customized to help you in that process as well. Thank you. Right, so we'll go to the next slide. So as a, as a group, we realize that our teachers um, collectively have been doing a great job um, looking at data, looking at student work, and we realized that we had to use a broad context to define what student work was because we were coming from different states, we had different standards, um, and we really wanted it to be both formal and informal student work assessments things like exit tickets, assignments, and projects. Um, but we realized that, you know, just like our design challenge, we didn't always see actual planning of instruction based on the analysis that occurred from the discussion around student work and how students performed on both formal and informal um, assessments and, and work. So, the tool, if you go to the next slide, that we designed is actually a Google document. Um, and what it's designed to do is lead teachers, teacher leaders, and um, administrators through a process and a set of questions that will get at the planning of instruction um, based on how their students performed um, on learning tasks, whether they're formal or informal. And so if we go to the next slide, you'll actually see a screenshot from the, the template that we created. And the tool, it's completely customizable, but it, it really asks um, teachers to reflect on how their students um, performed 
but they put in a description of the student work. Um, so there's a description, a title, they actually can input objectives so that they can align it to multiple subject areas. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that there's areas for them to input. Um, this is just one specific slide that shows students who need additional support. But there are also areas for teachers to input students who meet grade level standards or the um, standards for that specific assessment or learning task, as well as students who have exceeded the expectation for the learning task. Because sometimes um, we may give a pre-assessment and students actually do better um, than we expect, or there's a, a question for a future standard on there and students actually um, are able to, to master that skill without having been taught. And so it gives teachers an opportunity then to think about, first of all, if the students have not met the standard, what are some possible remediation strategies for those students? What have we tried in the past? And then what might be the root cause so that we know um, sort of what to target in the future? So now we're actually getting at the planning of the instruction um, for the students. And if we go to the next slide, there's actually a QR code that will, would take participants directly to the tool because we want participants to be able to look at it and use the tool um, and see how it could work for them and their teachers. And um, now I'll turn it over to Danielle to talk about um, how we actually test, tested the tool out um, as a group. So when you take a look at this first slide, this first slide takes a look at some student work. So you'll see samples of student work from one of our elementary schools. Um, and so this is the way you can begin to start. So I do remember that someone asked the question about how can we get this started. So we want to move beyond just what to do when we analyze the student work, but what we're looking at what to do next. So you would use your own protocols with regards to analysis of student work, but it could be just as simple as this. So this particular side shows um, a couple samples of student work where the students did not get the standard. They did not meet the standards. And so these are students who we have identified as who need more support. And so when you get a chance to open up the tool, there will be a section in the tool where you will identify those particular students who are in need of more support. And if we can go to the next slide, you'll see the next section of students are students who actually met the standard. So these students met the standard, so then you need to begin to look at a couple things. So when we look at the student work here, we may be looking at the process that the students use to answer the questions because that may be some information that could be helpful for the students who need more support. And then also for our school, we looked at the teachers who taught these particular students because that could be some information that's critical when we go back um, to reteaching for students, it may be critical for us to take a look at some of the teachers who taught these particular students because maybe that instructional piece can be very helpful for another teacher and how to get this information across to our students. Next slide. The next set of students will simply be those students who need enrichment. So they have met the standard, they've gone beyond um, what we've asked them to do and so now we need to figure out some work um, some enrichment activities for them. Sometimes this is a set of students that often gets left behind because we assume they've got it and we're really focused on those students who don't have it. But these particular students also need to be considered and how we can enrich and engage them um, in the lesson because these are the students who may become the behavior problems that someone brought up earlier because they are disengaged in the instruction. Next slide. And so for me as a school in our building, it was very important for us to discover what the learner-centered problem was. And so when we analyzed our data and we looked at our student work and we separated our student work into those three different areas, we were able to look at uh, what tended to be the concern or the problems that the students had or demonstrated in their work. But more importantly, on the next slide, you'll notice that we were able to come up with some themes and then we talked about implications 
for us as teachers and the instruction. So not only looking at the errors that the students made or where they struggled, but then going back and using that as a way to reflect on the teaching part. So what we decided to do is we saw what the students did and what they produced on the student work. So then we began to create some teams to go in to see the instruction that produced that work. So we had teachers go into other teachers' classrooms and just simply note their noticings, the questions that were asked, how the students were engaged. And then we took a look back at our instruction. So then we began to take a look at teachers. And so the teachers then began to think about the instructional piece and the implications around how the instruction was delivered to the students in order to produce those particular results. Next slide. And so on this particular slide, we talk about how the tool can be customized for you. So one of the things, and I know Eddie talked about it earlier, is that you're able to make this tool fit your needs of your particular district or your school. Because we know every school and every district may be at different levels with regards to analysis um, of student work and what to do after that. Um, so one of the things to think about when you begin to roll this tool out, when you get a chance to look at it, it may be in your building, you may not want to roll it out to the full staff. You know your building best and you know what teachers would gravitate towards um, using this tool and which teachers will delve right in and begin to do the hard work. So the way to roll the tool out could be totally up to you. You can customize the tool in that um, you can upload some of the information from your district, so standards and the curriculum and things like that that you want to add to the particular tool that is um, indicative of things that are important in your particular district. So there may be some look-fors, there may be some things that certain departments um, have asked that you all do. So those are things that you can also include in the tool to help support the work. So this tool is very um, customizable for everybody. Um, it also allows for some opportunity of accountability for us as administrators, because what we've talked about in the discussion that teachers have shared in their um, discussion around the analysis of student work and what we've decided to do, then that gives us as administrators an opportunity to go back into the classroom and to actually look for those things that we've discussed. Next slide. So um, before we would take questions and comments, I would like to thank Eddie and Tisha and Danielle for um, doing the webinar. Obviously, the work is great work. They worked with a group of people across the country. And I know there will be questions, but one that I have that I would really like one of you to address is, how design thinking methodology help facilitate the production of this tool? So I think what, what I can say is that we, um, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about what the design challenge was, and then we kind of went through this process of thinking about, um, you know, what this could look like of, of gathering information of researching and then of of really trying to find out how we could take all this information and and then create something and we used um, the expertise of other principals and other groups and feedback from um, our teachers and people in our own districts to just continue to refine the tool, and so I feel like that's sort of how um, that process worked um, to get us to the point we are today. Yeah, I would I would echo that. It was definitely an iterative process because we presented this multiple times, and each time we did, we you know we got feedback, we we refined it and made some adjustments, and uh, really made it. In, in that last step of thinking about who the audience was and uh, who would be using it is trying to make it as user friendly as possible for, for leaders. And if I can also, no. I think this process really helped us because 
we were able to collaborate with others outside of our district. So we are really thankful for that particular process because sometimes in your own district, you kind of get the same ideas over and over, but this opportunity came about where we were able to talk to others outside of our district, which made the tool even more um, enhanced and effective. Right. Thank you. And John, are there other questions that came in? Well, there, there's just one at this point, but I want to re repeat to the folks on the line, if you have a question, please type it into the question box now. Um, how has the process changed the way you think about the use of data in your own work is the question that has come in. And um, if each one of you would like to take a moment and answer that, I'd appreciate it. So this is Keisha, um, and I think for for me, as I think I've been so used to as a principal, especially going from a traditional elementary school to a school where we're focused more on project-based learning, um, really looking at data in a much more broader context that, um, you know, student work products that might be small parts of a whole can be just as powerful as, you know, a standardized test. And I think my teachers have um, really come to see the value of really um, an approach that is much more holistic than just um, this, you know, assessment that might be every four to six weeks. And so I feel like it's really getting us to move kids um, much much more than we would have, but also see that um, we're looking at our students from a, a 360 degree view versus just um, are they good at math or, or reading. And I would say if I could add, this is Danielle, for our particular school, um, I think the tool was very helpful in moving the work because I think sometimes as a staff we get stuck on just the analysis part and identifying those students who can't meet the standards, those who didn't, and those who did. And we kind of get stuck there. We, you, we map out who got it, who didn't. But then the next step is what this tool really focused us on is the next step, what happens next. And it caused us to be very reflective. Sometimes teachers aren't always reflective in their practice. Um, and this caused us to be really reflective and what are we doing to yield these results and how can we change uh, what we're doing to try to um, ensure that all of our students are successful. So I think it really focused us on what happens next as opposed to just getting stuck in that whole um, analysis, uh, analysis of student work and then just identifying who can, who can and kind of just being stuck in that area. Yeah, and Danielle said everything I was going to say, but uh, j just the same thing is that a lot of time when we would get into our data dives, it, was, it felt like an autopsy where, okay, it's, it's done, we're moving on to the next standards, um, but it really has become more of the formative part of the process where we, we have to identify and then figure out what adjustments we're going to make um, while we can, and, and so that we're uh, not just seeing the data for what it is. And I think for my school, it really helped with the conversations uh, because a lot of times when teachers will get the data back, it's very easy for them to start, you know, digging into the why. Uh, uh, you know, I have this group of students, or I have the ELL kids, and it got into a lot of, you know, off track a little bit. And so having the tool really guided those conversations so that the data uh, wasn't dead, but it, was, it became more organic and, and leading into to meaningful conversations of what can we do now. And as Danielle said, what, what are our next steps? So that it, it became more hopeful than, you know, like I said, after, after the fact where, okay, this is, this is what it is. Um, we were able to use it as a springboard um, to, to think about our next uh, instructional enhancements or refinements or reteaching, remediation, all those kind of things. Thank you. Could, could someone talk about where uh, a participant can go to actually see the tool? tool? And I, I saw the QR code and I heard the comment about that, but where are these things housed? How can somebody get to them? So it's housed um, in Google. It's a Google document. Okay. The, the easiest way to do that, John, is to go to the NASSP website. Okay. And under online professional development, there is a section with all of the Wallace tools. 
So you will find seven different tools based on the five Wallace key practices and links to them there um, so they can get right on them from the NASSP website homepage, professional learning, online professional development, and then scroll down on the screen and you'll be able to see them. Thank you for that. Uh, there are no other questions that have come in at this time, so I would like to turn the, the floor back to any of the principals if you have any uh, final words for the audience. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, if I can just add that to really um, utilize the tool the best way you can for your particular building, the tool was really designed in mind for everybody to be able to use it as it fits your needs. Um, so really think about the rollout of the tool um, and how you would decide to use it. It could be just with new teachers. It may be just with veteran teachers. It is a computer. Um, it requires you to know a little bit about Google. So some teachers you have may not be comfortable um, utilizing. Um, technology. So just really think about the rollout of it because I think once um, people begin to see the success and the importance of the work, uh, the tool will speak for itself. But getting started, you really want to be um, very uh, careful or very uh, determined or, or, or sure about um, how you want it to roll out. Be very intentional. That's the word I'm looking for. Intentional about how you roll it out because that could make the difference with regards to other teachers um, becoming more engaged or involved or interested in using the tool. Thank you. Anybody else? I would just say at the end of the day, Go it's ahead. about you know, in, improving the student outcome and you know, planning the instruction and then delivering the instruction. And so one of the things that we didn't hit on is, you know, there's there's a way um, once the teachers um, input sort of their plan, their instructional plan for the student work, um, it creates an Excel file um, because the Google Doc then c captures that information. And as a school leader, I can then go into those classrooms and see that instruction take place. And that's also um, a way for the teachers to reflect on um, the instruction, but also um, for there to be sort of an accountability measure as well. Thank you. Eddie, you were going to say something? Uh, well, once again, she took everything I was going to say, but uh, the only thing I would add is, is that um, as a leadership team or as your admin team, it really does provide valuable information with that spreadsheet when you see uh, what some of the challenges, it, depending upon what you build into the tool, you can find out from the teachers what their needs are, what resources they feel like they need to, to do the things. Because it's not that the teachers don't want to help students and don't want to remediate, it's just sometimes they don't always know, okay, what are some other options, what are, uh, what's a, a, you know, a toolkit of resources, what staff development could be helpful in, in, in helping our students get there, those kind of things. So we have found that, that part of it uh, helpful as well. Thank you all very much. Uh, as you um, can see in the audience, I'm sure, uh, is aware, we, we have folks from all over the place on this call, and um, everybody's very busy, especially at this time of the day. Um, and so we are very grateful to the principals for uh, changing their schedules and making sure they're available to be a part of this. And, and of course, to Wallace for the work that they've done. Um, I'd like to advance just one more slide, and that is to invite you to the National Principals Conference, 2018 National Principals Conference, July 11th through 13th um, in Chicago, McCormick Place. And uh, we hope that some of you or all of you will join us there. It's a wonderful event. If you haven't been to one, I highly recommend it. And again, thank you to the principals. Jana, do you have any last words for the audience before we sign off? You know, I echo your sentiments about the good work that the principals did and the impact that this tool can have across the country. So thank you again to the three of you for doing the webinar. And with that, I will sign us off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.